For this week's true crime story, we are leaving the UK. Sorry about that, but it has to happen from time to time. Before we get into the story, let me just say, this is all I'm saying is, I'm Harley, and here we tell true crime stories, and whenever I've got the time, a few stranger than fiction as well. The disclaimers, as always, before we get into this, it is a true story, it's a real crime, that involve real people, and they have real family members, so please be very sensitive about commenting or sharing, but I do want you to comment and share it, just be a bit sensitive about how you word it. Dizer Leigh Busbeck was born on the 23rd of September 1997 in Kansas City, Jackson County, Missouri, USA. She was the second of four children and it's said that she was a very loving child and she enjoyed life and she had an affectionate smile. She attended Derek Thomas St. Joseph School and Southwest High School. During her junior year, she started Early College Academy Partnership between Kansas City School District and Penn Valley Community College. Now that went straight over my head, so I did look it up and the Early College Academy program is basically while you're still in high school doing your high school work, you can also do an Associate of Arts degree at the same time. And that on its own, you have to apply for this by the way, and she did apply, she got it, so she's working towards a degree while she's still in high school. And I didn't even know that existed, but to me that shows a massive level of dedication to her education. And she was doing really well. She had satisfied the requirements to receive the Honorary Associate of Arts degree. In 2016, Dyza was expected to graduate as a salutation from the Southwest High School. Her involvement included cheerleading, Junior Reserve Officers Training Corps, which is basically something that started after the World War to train younger people up to get them more fit and ready for the army and any conflicts that they may be needed in. She ran track, she did cross country running, she loved singing, she loved to dance, rap, take selfies, and she often made what she called goofy videos in which she made up these comedic characters. But it weren't only in her education that she was excelling in. Obviously, with all these things she's doing, all these extracurricular things, you'd think her time had been pretty taken up. But that's not the case. She had also been working at Foot Locker, which is the shoe store. And she was looking forward to attending Grambling University in the fall. Throughout her childhood, and not so much for her teens, but she did still attend, she went to the Lindwood Seventh-day Adventist Temple. It's said that she'd never met a stranger, which obviously means that everyone she meets, she's friendly with and addresses them as if they were a friend. And it's also said that she had plenty of friends, which is not surprising with her being so articulate and energetic and being friendly to everybody. You're obviously going to get a lot of friends. One of the best friends described her as a rose that grew from a crack in the concrete. And that is actually a Tupac Shakur song. And obviously it references the fact that something beautiful as a rose can come out despite all odds rise into this beauty from when it shouldn't really rise, the rough concrete. On Monday the 21st of March 2016 at quarter past 12, Kansas City, Missouri police were dispatched to a hotel, motel. It was a Four Acres Motel, room number 253 in Kansas City. Staff at the motel had gone into the room to clean and they'd found a dead body lying on the bed. Of course, this was the body of Dyza Busby. She'd been found laid face up on the bed with buttons missing from her blouse. The buttons were found on the bed side of her. She appears to have been redressed with her pants only partially pulled up. Her body had multiple scrapes, some to the forehead, some to the neck, some to the lips, some to the nose. And I did read somewhere that there were some cuts and rips on her clothes, but I couldn't find that anywhere, so I don't know if that's true. But the cuts around her face and neck and stuff are definitely something that's persistent, so it seems to be true. At this point, Dija's mom, who divorced her dad eight years before, thought she was missing. She, she hadn't heard that she'd been found. She hadn't been home for about 30 hours, so she phoned the police and filed a missing persons report. It weren't long after that she was contacted by the police, but we'll circle back to that in a minute. On the 5th of May 2016, Jackson County medical examiners ruled that the death was a homicide and it had been caused by asphyxiation by smothering. The body examination of Dyja's body ruled that she'd been anally sodomised. And as I said, the police did contact her family and they said that the last seen her the night before her body was found. That was Sunday the 20th of March 2016 at about half past eight at night. And that evening Dija had finished a shift at Foot Locker and went home. Then a few minutes prior to leaving the house she'd had a phone call from her dad. 
Jerry Busby. The room in which she'd been found at was rented on the day that she left home. And it was rented at half past nine, approximately at night time. So it had only been rented an hour after that Dijer had left the house. The motel CCTV shows Jerry entering the lobby in order to rent the room, and then he's seen walking out towards a vehicle which then drives towards a rented room. But interestingly, the next day when Dijer had been found, although Jerry was nowhere to be seen, the car was still outside the room. And as I said, Jerry was nowhere to be found. But the CCTV did show that at 3.30 in the morning, between Jerry arriving and Dizer being found the next day, a person matching Jerry's description was seen walking away from the motel wearing a black jacket and grey looking trousers. As he walked away from the motel across the car park, he turned south on Hickman Hills Drive. A little while later, a fast shop convenience store about 10 minutes south of the motel captures Jerry on CCTV. This time it's definitely Jerry, and he's wearing a black jacket with grey looking trousers and a yellow shirt. He buys some cigarettes and leaves the store, but he is at no point seen returning to the motel. On the morning of Thursday the 24th of March 2016, four days after Dijer had last been seen alive, at about 9.30 in the morning, Jerry K. Busby was arrested. He was arrested at 8215 Trust and he was still wearing the same clothes that he'd been seen wearing on CCTV. During police interrogations, Jerry did admit that he'd picked Dizer up. He even admitted to take him to the motel room and hiring the room, but he insists that that was for her and some friends. He then went on to state that he only stayed at the motel for 20 to 30 minutes. He then left and walked to a friend's house, and the reason that he walked on foot was because his car wouldn't start. Also adding that when he left, no one was in the room other than Dijer herself. Jerry denied ever having sexual intercourse or a sexual relationship with Dijer. And obviously at this point, things aren't quite right. Some it doesn't seem right, some it doesn't seem normal. He says they were only there for 20 to 30 minutes, but he had been seen leaving the motel, or somebody that were 99% likely to be him, leaving the hotel six hours after he'd arrived. So why would he lie about that? Obviously, this is sketchy as hell. There ain't a doubt in anyone's mind at this point that he's a person that's killed his daughter. The police got a search warrant and they processed Jerry, taking DNA samples and just checking him in person. Another interesting thing to note here, it was about this time, four days after a body had been found, that Dijer's mom had issued a protection order against Jerry Busby and she also filed for full custody of the children. Many close to Dijer said that Pretty much straight away, they expected that she could have died at the hands of her dad. And that's not all that surprising, because court documents dating back to 1994 reveal an extensive criminal record for Jerry, including a history of drug abuse, possession with intent to distribute, several drink driving misdemeanors, and right on the top is domestic abuse. Over the years, protection orders had been issued against him and then they'd been dismissed. In 2005, he also pled guilty to two counts of domestic assault in the second degree for physically abusing a family member, including hitting, kicking and throwing a television at the victim. He'd also pled guilty for violating a protection order that the victim had issued against him. While he was receiving long-term substance abuse treatment at Ozark Correctional Centre in 2006, he wrote a letter to the Jackson County judge asking for forgiveness for a minor infraction. He said, I miss my kids dearly and I can't wait to get free to be able to find out what's going on with them. I never wanted my kids to be shocked like this in their lives and around strangers. He also goes on to talk about how he endured serious abuse as a child. This is not something I had planned on my children to have to go through. Six months after Dijer had been found, on the 19th of September 2016, Kansas City Police Crime Laboratory reported in court that they'd found DNA that matched Dizer's on a penile swab from Jerry. They also found DNA of Jerry's on swabs from Dizer. The swabs were from her mouth and from her anus. Jerry Busby was charged with first degree murder, sodomy, incest and sexual abuse. Jerry was sentenced on the 20th of September 2016. In court, the Jackson County Prosecutor took out a phone and started a timer. The court sat in silence for 30 seconds. After the 30 seconds, she exclaimed, This is how long she fought. It's a long time to go without a breath. Then she slammed the phone down. The assistant prosecutor said, 
Every place we look, we find the defendant. His DNA was all over Dijer. In her sister's victim impact statement, she said we both experienced hell on earth while we were growing up. It felt like we were unworthy of a good life, but she was determined. Her happiness in a world of evil. I wanted to be just like her. Life was so traumatic for Dijer, and it ended so traumatically. He was supposed to protect her, and instead he killed her. He's a monster. In their closing arguments, Jerry's defense attorney claimed that there were insufficient evidence to prove that he'd killed Dijer. She even went as far as to argue that what happened that night before Dijer had died was consensual. Why would she drive with her father to a motel if she didn't want to have a consensual sexual relationship with him? Why would she remain there for hours if she didn't want to be there? Most teens would probably go there to get drugs or alcohol. She was going there to have a secret rendezvous with her dad. She's not a victim. She was a willing participant. Of course, Jerry also made a statement in court. And I suppose it's moments like that that you really get to know a person. I mean, are they regretful? Are they emotional? Are they empathetic? Or are they just sat there not giving a damn? Daja's aunt had previously said that Daja had a lot of respect for her dad and she really did trust him. She said that she was appalled to see that Jerry were unwilling to take responsibility and show any remorse. Yeah, that's right. No remorse and not willing to take responsibility. Because he said things in court like, the incest virus made its way to me. What the hell is an incest virus? He then went on to refer to the murder of his daughter, an extremely unfortunate occurrence. But he went further than denying culpability. He seemed unfazed with the entire thing and he claimed he was a victim. He took to the stand and spoke for 45 minutes. Throughout his entire 45 minutes, he only mentioned Dijer once. And that was to say, yes, Dijer was a star. A release from Jackson County Prosecution Office said he blamed racism and what he viewed as slavery in modern America as forming him into what he was. During his rant, he talked about his schizophrenic mom, who he claimed used to beat him with electrical cords. He talked about his mental health issues, racism, and conspiracy theories about the criminal justice system. But it weren't enough. It were quite clear to the court that Jerry Busby had done these crimes. He was sentenced to two consecutive life terms, one for second degree murder and one for sodomy. He was also sentenced to another four years for incest and another seven years for sexual abuse. In the aftermath of Dijer's death, a memorial garden was unveiled at the Penn Valley campus, and weeks after her death, a classmate dedicated the commencement event to her. The chair that she would have been sat on was draped with her honor cord, academic hood, and picture. Dijer's mother was presented with Dijer's associate's degree. That's all I've got for you. Sorry if you like the UK true crimes, but every now and again we do have to venture out. This caught my attention, and I thought it was worth telling, because no one's really told it before, and it's quite a sick story. There is also bits of information that I'd have liked to have got that I couldn't get, so I'd, I'm very sorry if you think it's missing vital parts of information. It is a very sad story, and I don't think there's a massive lesson to learn here, because I, I don't think we should not trust people. It's very hard, it's very heartbreaking, and I'm, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing what you think about it. Um, and if there's any advice that you think is applicable to this, please do put it in the comments. Thank you for watching. Next week, guys.